Well, welcome to you guys who are in the church today. We welcome you. We also welcome those online, however they're watching, wherever they're watching. I don't know if we're jealous that maybe they're on the other side. I don't know if they're on a beach somewhere. I don't know. Uh, I, would, I would respect them really greatly if they were tuned in from the beach. But anyway, wherever they are, we appreciate you guys tuning in. Are you glad to be here at least? All right. Nice and spread out. So good deal. Good deal. Um, we are continuing our, our series uh, throughout the summer. We've been just calling stories. And what we're going to do is pull out some familiar stories and maybe some hidden gems throughout Scripture, Old Testament, New Testament, just to kind of pull those out and see how can we apply that to our lives. The next couple of weeks at least, including today, we're going to talk about some stories that talk about serving, that Jesus serving people because it was counterculture. Today's story we're going to talk about is Jesus washes feet. Because throughout, throughout his ministry on this earth, just that three, three and a half year period, he, he did amazing things that were counterculture. So, so he would show up to this, you know, this, this man that had leprosy, and he would, he would step into his space, even though he was spiritually unclean and he was highly contagious. Jesus said, okay, well, I'm going to step into your space. It wasn't like he was making a statement like, I don't believe that this is real. I don't believe leprosy is real. That's not what the statement he was making, right? He was just saying, hey, I came to heal. And I sense that you have faith. And so he stepped into his space. He, he healed this man, changed his life forever. It was also a time where he stepped into this, this, uh, this, this space of, of the Samaritan community. And, and the Samaritans and Jews didn't really get along in that time. In fact, many times the Jews would go out of their way to kind of dodge that, that part of the country. And, and the disciples were like, why are we going through there? And Jesus was like, I'm up to something, basically. And so he's up at the well. He's hanging out. And this woman comes as the disciples are going to get lunch. And so he just kind of begins this conversation. And he, and he talks about who she really is, even though she had not told him who she is and what her issues were. And he ministered to her. He turned her life upside down. The, the, all, the point of this is, is that Jesus didn't just come. I mean, this, you talk about the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He had all the power and might at his disposal. We've talked about this many times. We understand that he could have called down angels to rescue him from the cross. He could have called down angels to rescue him as he was wandering in the wilderness. And not just wandering, but fasting in the wilderness. And then facing temptation from the enemy after those 40 days were up. But he embraced it. He engaged it. And he said, I'm not just here to be an authority. <laughs> he preached with authority. But here's how he lived. He lived to serve and we find this in Mark chapter 10, verse 45. He says, For even the Son of Man, he's kind of talking about himself, came not to be served, but to serve others. And ultimately, how did he serve? What was his big way of serving? Is to give his life as a ransom for many. The enemy thought that he had won. The enemy thinks that he is in control. The enemy believes that he is ultimately deceived that he has power over you because of what you've done and the sins that you've committed. But we stand on the promise that Jesus said, I died for you, I've forgiven you, and if you step into my sonship and, and daughtership, if you step into that, you are no longer who the world says you are. You are who I say you are. He stepped in on our behalf. This story that we're going to get into, Matthew's version of, of this dispute before Jesus washes the feet is, is very interesting. We're going to talk about Luke's in just a few minutes. But, but Matthew's version of this is, is interesting because these disciples were gathered around this, this last supper, this meal that they're sharing with Jesus. They you know, to kind of get an idea that this might be coming to an end, at least this part of his ministry and what it might look like. They had their assumptions, but, but they're, they're kind of jockeying for position. They're, they're kind of saying, well, well, I want this position, I want this position once you're in charge, right? And this is Matthew's record of this, Matthew chapter 20. He says, but Jesus called them to him. He basically said, hey guys, listen up. And if, and if Jesus ever says, listen up, then we need to kind of pay attention. He says, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. We're not going to play like the world plays. We're not going to lead like the world leads. We're not going to impact like the world impacts. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. Jesus is changing everything. You see, the rabbis in this day, which is what he would have fit into, they saw him as a rabbi. They would have fit into this place of, of reverence. 
I mean, nobody touched the rabbis. I mean, nobody, nobody you know, asked them of anything. Nobody questioned them. They just, whatever they said, because they spoke for God. So everybody just assumed, okay, well, they're speaking for God. And these rabbis in that day weren't just guys who were there serving and loving and you know, starting ministries to help people in the community. These rabbis did a little bit something different because they felt like they had the authority from God. They stood on the street corners and they prayed for people. And that sounds really nice and warm and fuzzy, but here's how they would pray for people. If you were just walking down the street of Nacogdoches and one of these guys was praying for you on the street corner, they would pray out loud and they had heard what you were up to and they'd just call you out. I pray for so-and-so. You know what they were up to last weekend. I pray for so-and-so. I was just counseling with them last week and God, you know. So we're talking about this idea of holding it over people, that this this, this place of I'm in a position for God, and they said, well, you, you don't have this connection like we have, and so they felt like they were speaking for God to the people, not being with the people. Jesus came to turn that up, upside down. He said instead of leading, you know, from the top down, and, and using your authority and using your position and jockeying for position and thinking that's what's going to change the world, guys, we're going we're to change it. We're going to flip it upside down. What if we served from below? What if we served from the bottom to the top? What if sometimes the top is the problem? What if assuming you have all the authority and need all the authority is the problem? Paul, as he was ministering to Corinth, this, this city that greatly needed Jesus, just like every city in the world, 2 Corinthians 4 or 5, he said, he said this, For what we preach is not ourselves. So he's saying, God, it's not about us. It, it's not about our authority. It's not about our glory. It's not about our stuff. It's about him. But Jesus Christ as Lord. And when you understand what a Lord is, a Lord is someone in that day and age who had absolute power, absolute authority over you. You had no rights outside of that. And so you understand Jesus is my Lord. He's in charge of my life. And ourselves, your servants... For whose glory? You're not just serving with an agenda. You're serving with the only agenda of, I just want to glorify Christ. I want to do it like he did it. So servants for Jesus' sake. Paul understood in order to make a difference. And it's no different today. In order to impact the culture with all we're going through. I mean, we've talked about this a ton, but I've never been more ready to say 2020, let's go. (laughs) You know, you've got COVID, you've got all these, these riots, you've got all this stuff kind of going on, you have all this stuff in this division, and then all of a sudden we have this sand dust storm come through. You're like, okay, when is the mummy popping out of this thing? You know, so, so we have all this stuff kind of going on, and you're just like, where is God in this? Well, here's where God is. He's been in it. <laughs> I'm not saying God sent COVID. I'm not saying God sent That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying God expects us to be present to be servants, whatever the circumstances are around. And when, it, when he's exalted, when he is above everything, when we're doing it his way, when we're loving his way, not for our own glory, we're not posting things for our own glory, we don't have a hidden agenda, we're not saying things to build us up, we're not, we're not fishing for compliments, we're, we're not being passive-aggressive. When we're really, our only agenda is to glorify him, all of a sudden, God begins to change lives. Here's the point. It'll be on the screen for you. We can't be filled with ourselves and filled with the Spirit at the same time. You see, we can't say it's all about me and at the same time say it's all about Jesus and it's all about other people. (laughs) Jesus knows that his time, at least on earth, is closing out. He he knows that, that he's spending his final evening with his disciples, these guys that, that he's thinking, okay, knowing, not thinking, he's, he's knowing that they're going to be in charge of this, this movement that's going to take over. He knows that. He knows it's going to be something that's within. He knows what's going to happen. But here's what the disciples are assuming. The disciples kind of sense that something's happening too. They sense that something's up. Maybe it's a vibe that they felt because they've been around Jesus for all this time. They they know him by now. But what they were assuming is that what he was going to change, what he was going to take over, what he was going to kill was the Roman Empire. That's what they thought. They thought, well, he's going to come. I don't know what he's doing with this army. And, you know, maybe he has all this authority. Maybe something's going to happen. We've seen him do amazing things. So I don't know what he has planned, but we trust him. We trust that he has a plan to take over the Roman Empire. 
And so what they were doing is jockeying for position. You see, if, if they believe that Jesus was going to take over and he's going to be seated on the, in the center throne of this new empire, whatever he's going to call it, if he's going to be in center, who's going to be sitting next to him? Who's going to be in this charge? Who's going to be in charge of the army? Who's going to be in charge of the treasure? Who's going to be in charge of all these kingdoms? Because if we set up this kingdom, maybe there's other kingdoms to come. Maybe I can be lord of that kingdom. Maybe you can be lord of that kingdom. And so I don't know who started the dispute, but if you've read your Bible enough, you know about disciples, I would put my money on Peter starting this debate. But somebody started it. And according to Matthew, we read about earlier, and Luke it wasn't just Peter saying, I want that position. Other disciples got into the dispute. And it became this thing where they're arguing about who's going to get this, who's going to get that, who's going to be the greatest. And even saying to the point where, Jesus, who's your favorite? Haven't I been better than so-and-so? Haven't I done more than so-and-so? Remember all the stuff that you asked me to do? It was more than so they're jockeying. I don't know if you've ever done that with God before. And here's how we do it with God. We say, God, I want this to happen in my life. I want this to change. And here's where the jockeying happens. It's when we step into him in our present, in his presence and we prayer and we're pouring our hearts out to God and we say, God, look at all the stuff I've done for you. Look at how good I've been. Look at how good I am in comparison to so-and-so. Don't you think in the midst of that dispute that some of the disciples said, um, don't you remember what Peter said? just last week don't you remember Luke saying this don't you see if we're not careful we do the same thing we might not do it face to face hopefully we don't do it through social media but sometimes we just try to throw under pe other people under the bus to make ourselves look better and we do it in the name of prayer we do it in the name of prayer request we do it in the name of God I just want you to hear my heart They're jockeying. And this is what Luke said, at least his version of how it went down. Luke chapter 22. Jesus said to them, The kings of the Gentiles, who said how the worldly people, lorded over them. And those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. So they spin it, right? They're saying, we're benefiting, you're benefiting. Verse 26. But you are not to be like that. So he says, that's how the world acts. That's how they are doing it. That's how they're playing the game. But listen, church, we're not doing it that way. If we're doing life the way the world does it, can we just get this? We're doing it wrong. We're doing it wrong. We're doing it all wrong. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest and the one who rules like the one who serves. In verse 27, he asks this, these rhetorical questions. He says, for who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? They're like, that's kind of a no-brainer, right? I mean, I'm better. If somebody's serving me, that makes me better. Is it, is it not the one who is at the table? So they're, he's kind of leading them, right? And he says, but I am among you as one who serves. And then all of a sudden you can imagine their minds just like, what? We've been jockeying. We've been arguing. We've been debating on who's the best. Who gets to be served? <laughs> We've been arguing and debating on who gets to be in charge. We get, we get to arguing about, okay, what are the benefits of being a follower of Jesus? I want to be blessed. If I'm following Jesus correctly, then it's all about my blessings. And I'm counting this as a blessing. I'm counting. So the, the hard stuff I go through, the hardships and the turmoil and things that I go through that aren't, aren't necessarily my own doing, those things, if I'm going through them, if I'm not careful, I blame God and say, okay, God, this is part of it. Going through a hardship doesn't mean you've done something wrong. It simply may mean that God wants you to be more mature. Maybe he wants to use that hardship for his glory. And ultimately, your gain as well. If there's any hardship that we walk through with Jesus, we always come out stronger on the other side. We never come out weaker. So, again, they assume that this Kingdom's going to be established. They're jockeying for this major position. And then I'm going to get to the heart of the story in John 13. It says, It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. 
The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of uh, Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. So he got up from the meal, took his outer clothing, so he took his kind of a robe thing off, his outer clothing off, and he wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Now, let me... Let me kind of further set up what's happening here. In, in these types of meals, we would relay, the closest we could get to this would be something like a Thanksgiving or Christmas dinner where, you know, we have family over, we, we know what we're having, it's traditional, and if you try to serve something other than turkey, you're going to get in trouble, right? I mean, I'm all about you changing it up. But anyway, you, you know their traditions. So they knew what they were stepping into, and they also knew that it was tradition for them to have a nice meal. There needed to be a foot washer that needed to be hired. Now, this would have been a lowly of low. This was something something that people had had done professionally, but it was low. It was considered, I mean, you didn't look at them in the eye. They were there to wash your feet, and that was a lowly task. Why was that lowly? It was lowly because they didn't have these shoes like we're wearing the closed toes. I mean, we're in over summer. Some of you are wearing flip-flops. You get that. But imagine you wearing those open-toed, you know, flip-flops and sandals around dirt streets, And think about who's also walking on those dirt streets as we get a little bit gross and a little bit real. The donkeys are walking in it. There weren't any public restrooms. Can we we just get a picture for just a second? That's what they're walking in. Now to also understand why it was important to have someone washing their feet and understand that it was someone who was lowly and paid, you know, below minimum wage kind of thing is because when they lounge to eat, they lounge to eat. They didn't have a table covering their feet and their legs. They were lounging. So as Peter lounged this way, his feet might be over here, right in John's face, and so on and so forth. Now think about it for a second. Every disciple walked into that room expecting their feet to get washed. That's important because it was a custom. They expected that. But every one of them walked in and they looked and nobody was there. It was just the basin and maybe a towel. But they kept walking. Pretended like, well, somebody must have forgotten to hire a foot washer. I'm not doing it. And they walked and the mill began to happen. You can smell, right? I mean, I think they had nostrils. They could smell what's happening. Probably they didn't want to say it because they're ignoring it. Maybe somebody forgot to hire the person and they're feeling guilty, so they're hoping nobody says anything. But in the midst of this, as we just talked about, in the midst of this, Jesus gets up. As he's just talked about and and gotten on to them for jockeying for position and saying, it's not about being in charge, guys. It's not about a position. It's not about power. It's not about title. It's not about you. It's not even about us. It's especially not about me. And let me show you what I mean by that. Let me show you how important serving is and what it's going to look like and he gets up and he goes over and he gets this basin and he puts water in it and he takes his own clothes and it becomes a towel and and you just imagine in that moment what it must have been like for those disciples Imagine, imagine this rabbi, this teacher, who, who, who and you've been raised that these rabbis, I mean, they're way up here. They're speaking for God. And if they say something, it's from God. And you're supposed to revere them. They don't get their hands dirty. They don't do things like this. They don't serve. We serve them. That's why every young boy growing up in Israel and as a Jew, they wanted to be that. Why? Because they wanted to be served. And it wasn't anything prideful. I think it became prideful. But it was, that was a revered position. It was a place of honor. But Jesus said, no, that's not what I'm about. I didn't come for you to serve me. I came to serve you. And I want you to think about just personally for, for us. Because we all have that thing. That there's no way that's what I'll do. (laughs) I'm not going to do that. Some of us dads, we probably thought to ourselves when we had that first kid, 
I'm not going to change that diaper. I'll change the wet ones, but when it comes to the solids, I'm out. I'm sorry, I just had to. But I'm not doing that. I'm, I'm not, and so you can jockey for what your roles are going to be. You can do whatever, but let me just say, there's something about when you both, especially as a married couple, when you both understand my role isn't necessarily having a role. My role is to be there for one another. My role is to serve, and we understand that for our kids, and the best way for our kids to understand is when we serve them, when we love them, and then when it flips around, hopefully eventually, right? And that's when we, we're never more like Jesus than when we're serving, On the cross, Jesus showed us that no assignment was too big for him to do. I mean, he was willing to, to go the distance. But in the upper room, he showed us that no assignment was too small for him to do. You see, it wasn't just about him coming to die and make this major statement, which was the ultimate servant thing to do, right? But, but imagine for a second what it, what it must have been like for Jesus to look in the eyes of his disciples and for his disciples to look into the eyes of him. And as he's doing this lowly task, think about the impact. Think about the lasting impact. Don't you think that in the end, these disciples, they went from jockeying for positions to being willing and ultimately dying for the cause of Christ, this Christian movement. You have to know that, that in their dying breath, that as they're, as they're pursuing it, as God's changed, they're, they're constantly reminded as they're looking down with their filthy feet and they're looking down into the eyes of their Savior. That's what He did for us. And if we're to be like Him, that is what we're supposed to do for others. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said this about serving. He says, everybody can be great because anybody can serve you don't have to have a college degree to serve. You don't have to make your subject and verb agree to serve. You only need a heart full of grace. A heart generated by love. So the question I have for us to just work through and think through and allow God to search me is that how is God leading me? Not someone else to serve me. But how is God leading me to serve those who love me as well as those who have hurt me? And why is that important? Why, why those two contracts? But here's the deal. Who was at the table at that time? Who was at the table? John was at the table. John, he, he loved Jesus. And Jesus loved John. John was the guy who, who was tapped to take care of Jesus' mom. Right? So he loved him. He trusted him. He knew that he was a guy who he could trust. He loved him dearly. But who also was at the table was Judas. This is the guy who was going to sell him out for just 30 pieces of silver. And the guys, that's not a lot of money. 30 pieces of silver was, is not going to get him through the next week. <laughs> 30 pieces of silver was not a lot of money. But Judas was there and he washed his feet. But also Peter, the guy who was in denial. He's not just denied knowing him, but he was in denial in that moment because he believed that he was going to be for him no matter what happened. We're, we're, I'll, I'll die for you. I'll do anything for you. Jesus washed his feet. So how do we serve those that hurt us? It's simple, but it's very difficult. It's forgive. And we've talked about this a lot as a church. For just because I forgive somebody doesn't mean I've said what you did to me is okay. It's not making it right. Here, here's the deal. Don't miss it. It's not making that act right but it's making this right. So that when this is right, this can be right. Because if I'm harboring bitterness and unforgiveness, and God can't love through me, He can't serve through me because He's having to work through this, this hard rock of a heart. We think we're letting people get over, or get, get, um, be okay with it. We think we're, we're letting them off the hook. But we're actually letting ourselves off the hook. How do we love those who love us? And this isn't just that dynamic between parents and children and just friends and things. I think it's knowing what they need and stepping into it. 
You know, early on in, in our marriage, I made this promise, and it's become kind of a, a, a church joke, is that I made a promise that, hey, Amy, I can't cook. So if you'll cook, I'll wash the dishes. And so uh, that's become a thing, and we both held each other to that, right? But, but, as I, but as we've grown and as we've matured in 20 plus years of marriage, what I've found is that, that we don't need lines, right? You don't need lanes to stay in. Serving is not a lane. Serving is not a, a line. It's not, okay, well, here's your list, here's my list. Well, why didn't you do this? It really is about if I see something, I do it. And so we think about how do we serve, how do we love, how do we show grace, just like we're talking about here. How do we live this out, especially with people we're living every day with and regularly with? We just serve them. As needs arise, we step in, and we serve them. And if there's something that's holding us back from that, if there's something that says, well, they didn't do, well, that's me. That's my issue. It's not theirs. <laughs> How powerless must have Jesus felt <laughs> as he's washing their feet? How powerless must he have felt when he's surrendering himself to the cross? But he knew that by doing that, it would do the greater good than him slapping everybody, which is probably what we would have done and justified, we feel. What we're saying is, are we showing grace? Are we, are we listening? Are we willing to look up and quit being so me-focused and what I feel is right and what I deem is justified? And just look up and look around and say, really, how would Jesus handle this situation? If Jesus were in my shoes, what would he do ultimately? Will you bow your heads with me? God, I love you so much. I'm thankful that you love me. I'm thankful that you love me when I was unlovable. I thank you that you love me in my sin. I thank you that you are willing to love me through that as, as you forgave me and as you keep loving me every single day. I pray that you would allow this story to, to just transform our heart, to challenge us, to think of ways to serve others. Whether it's people who are easy to love or hard to love. God, you called us to love. You called us to serve. You prove that to us by not just washing those feet of, of the feet of every disciple around that table, but you died for every person. You died for that soldier who, who had the hammer in his hands, driving that nail through your, through your wrist. So God, you love love and you're willing to serve to the very end so God may we be more like you God help us show us how we can serve those around us how we can listen to those we don't understand so God before we speak before we post before we get into disputes God help us to listen God, how would you have us to handle this season, this situation, this season in our life, God? We want to be more like you than like us. If you're here today, whether through video or here in the church, and you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, I want you to know that today can be the day that you make that right, that you invite him into your life. And so if that's you, you say, I don't know Jesus is my personal Savior, but I want to. Just lift your hand if you're here today. Anyone. 